Hello, this is Dr. Cotty, and today we're going to talk about depressive disorders. When we're discussing the signs and symptoms of depressive disorders in this lecture, as well as medication, I would like to note that individuals who are older may have signs and symptoms that are much different than children. So please just keep in mind if you work with children, that the signs and symptoms of depression, as well as the medication, may vary. Objectives. Discuss predisposing factors in symptomatology related to the various types of depression. Identify patient-centered care interventions in clients experiencing mood disorders. Examine the various treatment modalities and risk and benefits of each. When we think about depression, the first thing that we need to do, I think, is to define what is mood. And mood is defined as a pervasive and sustained emotion that may have a major influence on a person's perception of the world. So it's their attitude. And depression is associated with disturbances in psychological, emotional, and social function. Depression is a mood disorder. It is one of the highest causes of disability in the United States. And individuals with depression have a potential risk for suicide. That risk is higher if they have a family or personal history of suicide attempts, comorbid conditions like chronic medical conditions, substance use, low self-esteem, and a lack of support. Individuals with depression also may be experiencing experiencing anxiety, psychotic symptoms or bipolar disorder, substance use disorder, eating disorders, and personality disorders. They also may have comorbid medical conditions that influences the severity of their depression. The American Psychiatric Association, or APA, updated the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders the DSM, to its fifth edition in 2013. So the DSM-5 is the book that we use to help us classify mental health disorders. The APA had a task force of about 160 researchers and clinicians that updated, revised, or removed some of the information in the DSM-4. So this book has descriptions, symptoms, and other criteria for diagnosing mental disorders. It's revised to make sure that the most up-to-date research and scientific findings are included in our diagnostic criteria. The DSM-5 classifies depressive disorders as follows bipolar one disorder, and we'll talk more about that in an upcoming lecture, major depressive disorder, persistent depressive disorder, also known as dysthymia, premenstrual dysphoric disorder, substance or medication induced depressive disorder, depressive disorder due to another medical condition, or unspecified depressive disorder. The DSM-5 criteria for major depressive episode is listed on this slide. Now, major depressive episode would be considered unipolar depression. So let's go through these criteria. Over two weeks, the client has experienced a change from previous functioning with depressed mood or decreased interest or pleasure and at least five of the following symptoms. One, depressed mood most of the day, nearly every day. So the individual might say they feel sad, empty, or hopeless. We might see a diminished interest or pleasure in almost or all of their activities most of the day or every day. Significant weight loss when not dieting or weight gain so a change of more than 5% of body weight. 
And in children, this would be um, maybe a failure to make an expected weight gain. You might see insomnia or hypersomnia, psychomotor retardation or agitation nearly every day. And this would be observed by others. So not just like the subjective feeling of restlessness or feeling slow, but in a way that other people notice. The individual may also have excessive or inappropriate guilt. This could be delusional. Um, nearly every day. Diminished ability to think or concentrate or indecisiveness. Recurrent thoughts of death. So not just the fear of dying or suicidal ideation with a, without a specific plan or with a plan or a suicide attempt are also signs and symptoms of depression. So let's go through those one more time. Depressed mood, difficulty or excessive sleeping, indecisiveness, a decreased ability to concentrate, suicidal ideation, an increase or decrease in motor activity, inability to feel pleasure, weight loss or weight gain, insomnia, or hypersomnia and fatigue every day. In order to meet criteria, the symptoms need to be bad enough that it causes clinically significant distress or impairment in social, occupational, or other areas of functioning, and that these symptoms are not due to substance abuse, medication, or another medical condition. There are a variety of screening tests for depression, and many of these screen for the symptoms that we just went over on the previous slide. So these include the Hamilton Depression Scale, the Beck Depression Inventory, the Patient Health Questionnaire, otherwise known as the PHQ-9, these are nine questions, Zung Depression Scale, Geriatric Depression Scale, and the National Mental Health Association has some other online screening tools for individuals. There are a variety of screening Before we move on, I wanted to review some vocabulary words that you'll need to know. Dysthymia, persistent mild depression. In some, at least two years of dysthymia occur. And for some individuals, this can lead to major depressive disorder. Cyclothymia is a mood disorder that causes emotional highs and lows, but the mood shifts are not as extreme as those in people who have bipolar disorder. Affective means relating to moods, feelings, and attitudes. Hallucinations. That is when an individual experiences something that is not real, that's not present. So there are auditory hallucinations where people might hear things, visual, they may see things, or tactile, they may feel things. Some individuals have had olfactory hallucinations. But I would say those are less common. That's where they smell something that's not there. Delusions um, is a belief that an individual continues to hold despite that evidence is proving something different. So evidence can contradict the reality or a rational argument could contradict this, but it is a fixed, it could be a fixed illusion that never changes or the individual just holds this belief despite the fact that there's evidence proving it's incorrect. Labile. So this is when an individual has an emotion that tends to alter quickly and spontaneously. 
So emotional instability, luteal phase. The luteal phase is one stage of a menstrual cycle and it occurs after ovulation. So once the ovaries release the egg and before your period starts, that's the luteal phase. Energia, abnormal lack of energy. And anhedonia, the inability to feel pleasure. Let's take a closer look at some depressive disorders. Dysthymia disorder is a milder form of depression that usually has an earlier onset. So it may begin in childhood or adolescence, and it could last approximately one year in length for children and two years in length for adults. It would contain only three of the clinical findings of depression that we spoke about on the earlier slide and could eventually become major depressive disorder. PMDD or premenstrual dysphoric disorder occurs with the luteal phase of the menstrual cycle and signs and symptoms could be emotional lability, lability, so big mood swings, persistent or severe anger and irritability. These individuals also may have a lack of energy, overeat and experience difficulty with concentration during that phase of their menstrual cycle. If you recall earlier, we discussed that depressive disorders may also have specifiers added to them in the DSM-5 classification. So sometimes depression could become so bad that the individual has psychotic features such as hallucinations or delusions. They also might experience seasonal affective disorder that most often occurs in the winter and can be treated with light therapy. Depression with peripartum onset is a specifier that can be applied again if the mood symptom occurred during pregnancy or in the four weeks following delivery. When we are caring for a client with depression, our treatment depends on what phase the client is in. So in the acute phase, the characteristics would be severe clinical findings of depression. Treatment then would usually be six to 12 weeks, which is the duration of this phase on average. The individual may need hospitalization. And our goal is to reduce the depressive symptoms to assess suicide risk, implement safety precautions, and observe them one-on-one -on -one if we need to. In the continuation phase, the patient characteristic would be an increased ability to function. This treatment could last four to nine months in duration. And here our goal is relapse prevention through education, medication therapy, and psychotherapy. In the maintenance phase, hopefully we see remission of manifestations. And this phase could last for years, but the goal here is prevention of future depressive episodes. When we are caring for a client with depression, when you are a nurse, you will assess the patient for risk factors. These risk factors may include a family or personal history of depression. Depressive disorders are twice as common in females between the ages of 15 and 40 than in males. And it's very common among clients over the ages of 65. It's common, but not normal. It's important to differentiate between early dementia and depressive signs and symptoms. Neurotransmitter deficiencies or genetic factors are risk factors. So for example, with serotonin deficiency, affects mood, sexual behavior, sleep cycles, hunger, pain perception, norepinephrine deficiency can affect attention and behavior. And those are both risk factors for depression. Other risk factors include stressful life events or situations, a presence of a medical illness, postpartum, poor social support, comorbid substance use disorder, being unmarried, so single, 
Depression might be the primary disorder, or it could be a response to another physical or mental health disorder. But remember, depressive disorders can occur throughout all groups of people. Now, subjective data, so this would be information the client would report. So they may report energia, or lack of energy, anhedonia, lack of pleasure in normal activities, anxiety, reports of sluggishness, which is the most common, that would be psychomotor retardation, or psychomotor agitation, which is a feeling of being unable to relax or sit still. You might see vegetative, vegetative findings. This would include a change in eating patterns, a change in bowel habits, such as constipation or diarrhea, sleep disturbances, and decreased interest in sexual activities. We might have reports of fatigue, gastrointestinal changes, or pain. Objective data, so things we observed um, upon physical assessment, might be the client's affect may appear sad or blunted. We might see poor grooming or lack of hygiene. Again, psychomotor retardation or agitation. Perhaps the client is socially isolated and shows little to no effort to interact. Or slowed speech, decreased verbalization, delayed responses, and sometimes the opposite. Perhaps they're talking too fast or too loudly with their thoughts hopping from topic to topic. Patient-centered care from nursing can include several things when we're dealing with patients who have depression. Milieu therapy or um, environmental therapy. So we want to assess the client's risk for suicide and implement appropriate safety precautions. Make sure they're performing their activities of daily living, like showering. Communicate with them clearly and allow sufficient time for them to respond. Maintain a safe environment. And they might need individual counseling, such as problem solving, new coping techniques, community resources, or things that will help increase their self-esteem. When it comes to medication, we want to provide education for the client, discuss risk and benefits, and tell them to call the provider if they're having any thoughts of suicide. Remind them therapeutic benefit may not be immediate. It could take several weeks, up to two months, to feel the medication working. Psychotherapy by a trained therapist could include cognitive behavioral therapy, which helps the individual identify and change negative behavior and thought patterns, or interpersonal therapy, which encourages the client to focus on personal relationships that contribute to the depressive disorder. Some individuals use St. John's wort. That's a plant not regulated by the FDA, but some people take that medication to help with mild depression. They need to be educated that it can increase or, re or reduce levels of medication if it's taken at the same time. And it also can have some side effects that you may want to review. But if taken with an SSRI, it could cause serotonin syndrome. We'll talk about more about that in a bit. Light therapy, individuals with seasonal affective disorder, when exposed to the 10,000 lux light box for 30 minutes in the morning, um, may benefit and have see a reduction in depressive symptoms. So seasonal affective disorder and light therapy as an alternative or complementary therapy. ECT, TMS, uh, VNS, vagus nerve stimulation, those are also other alternative or complementary therapies. ECT is electroconvulsive therapy, and TMS is transcranial magnetic stimulation. And again, we'll talk more about those on the upcoming slides. 
Finally, in patient-centered care, we focus on care after discharge, which is the continuation phase. If you remember, the continuation phase is followed by the maintenance phase. So monoamines are a group of neurotransmitters that regulate mood, and these include serotonin, noradrenaline, and dopamine. Among the monoamines, serotonin is really important when we're thinking about major depressive disorders. One of its jobs is to regulate the other neurotransmitters. So without the regulation by serotonin, brain functioning can become erratic. So when serotonin levels are low, levels of noradrenaline drop and noradrenaline provides attention and reward. Low levels of noradrenaline are linked to lack of pleasure. Low levels of serotonin also cause dopamine levels to drop and dopamine is related to alertness and energy. Low levels of dopamine can be linked to anxiety. High levels of serotonin would boost noradrenaline and dopamine producing a hyper alert and psychotic state of mind. So that can be linked to bipolar disorder. So you can see that these neurotransmitters play an important part in regulating our mood. Here are the types of medication that can be used to treat unipolar depression. Selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, or SSRIs, tricyclic antidepressants, monoamine oxidase inhibitors, or MAOIs, atypical antidepressants, and SNRIs, or serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors. Out of these, we don't really use tricyclic antidepressants or monoamine oxidase inhibitors much anymore in, in practice. However, you will need to know them to pass the NCLEX, so we will study them. When a drug is approved by the FDA, it is given a generic and a brand name. The generic is the official name, and that's assigned by the United States Adopted Names Council. It's complicated and harder to remember than the brand name. It's usually a shortened version of the drug's chemical name, structure, or formula. The brand name, also known as the trade name, is developed by the company who's requesting the approval for the drug, and the, it, that drug is the exclusive property of that company. It's usually catchier, easier to use, and that's so that doctors will prescribe the drug and that consumers will recognize the name. SSRIs, or selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, are used to treat major depressive disorder or anxiety, and they improve mood, appetite, and sleep. They don't cause dependence, tolerance, or addiction, and would not be used for treatment in most cases for individuals who have bipolar disorder because it could cause mania or an increase in suicidal thoughts and an increase in anxiety. These medications are much safer than other types of antidepressants because they are much lower in lethality. So if an individual tried to overdose on the medications, they are much less likely to be successful. So fluoxetine is also known as Prozac, escitalopram or Lexapro, citalopram, also known as Celexa, paroxetine, or Paxil, sertraline, which is Zoloft, and fluvoxamine, which is Luvox. So for client teaching, we would want to advise the client that adverse effects may occur, and these include nausea, headache, or CNS stimulation, which would include things like agitation, insomnia, or anxiety. We would instruct the client that sexual dysfunction could occur and to notify the provider if the effects are intolerable. And the sexual dysfunction might either be inability to have an erection or inability to have an orgasm. We would want the client to observe for serotonin syndrome and to not take St. John's wort at the same time because that could increase serotonin syndrome. 
We would also want the client to follow a healthy diet because anecdotally, anecdotally um, some individuals say they experience weight gain, although that is not expected with these medications. You've heard me mention serotonin syndrome a few times. So what is it? Serotonin syndrome occurs when the medications that cause high levels of serotonin causes it to accumulate in your body. So it might happen a few days after you start a medication or if you increase the dose of a drug you're already taken, taking, but often it would occur if you took way too much of the medication or if you were taking drugs in the same medication category. So for example, you wouldn't want to take Celexa with Lexapro. So serotonin syndromes usually occur within several hours after taking the medication that would cause it. And signs and symptoms include agitation, confusion, an increase in heart rate or blood pressure, dilated pupils, twitching muscles or muscle rigidity, heavy sweating, diarrhea, headache, shivering, or goosebumps. Life-threatening symptoms would include high fever, seizures, or irregular heartbeat or unconsciousness. So this excessive accumulation of serotonin is what causes serotonin syndrome. Under normal circumstances, the nerve cells in your brain and spinal cord produce serotonin, then that help regulates your attention and behavior and body temperature. Serotonin is also produced by nerve cells in your intestines, and it helps regulate your digestive process, blood flow, and breathing. So this condition would most awfully occur if, if you combine certain, uh, certain medications. It's kind of rare if you just take an antidepressant by itself. An intentional overdose of antidepressants could cause the medication. Or mixing it again with St. John St. John's Wort. We want to avoid, have patients avoid herbal supplements unless they've discussed it with us. So, how do we diagnose serotonin syndrome? But well, the first thing we would want to do is to rule out any other medication um, interactions or medical reasons for this list of symptoms. Uh, one thing that we would want to rule out would be severe alcohol withdrawal. So there may be additional blood or urine tests, x-rays, that sort of thing. Depending on the symptoms, the individual may need some medications to treat these symptoms. So muscle relaxants, such as a benzodiazepine, would help with agitation, seizures, and muscle stiffness. There are serotonin production blocking agents. Oxygen and IVs could help with dehydration and fever. We may need to control the individual's heart rate or blood pressure. And with a really, really high fever, we might need a breathing tube or, mach or machine or medication to paralyze the muscles. So it can be a very serious, um, but it is a somewhat uncommon syndrome. Tricyclic antidepressants are an older antidepressant and they're called tricyclics or TCAs because of a three ring molecular core. Their side effects include cardiotoxicity, such as dysrhythmias, orthostatic hypotension, they can cause weight gain, and have anticholinergic properties. Can't see, can't pee, can't poop. So you'd want to have a high fiber diet for constipation and monitor urinary retention. These medications include amitriptyline or Elevil, clomipramine or anaphrol, doxepin, which is also called cinequin, and mipramine, which is also known as torphanol. And again, these medications are not prescribed very often. 
So for client teachings for these medications, we would want to advise the client to change positions slowly to minimize dizziness from orthostatic hypotension. To minimize the anticholinergic effects, we would want them to chew sugarless gum, eat foods high in fiber, and increase fluid intake from two to three liters a day from both food and beverage sources. Tricyclic antidepressants. Tri MAOIs or monoamine oxidase inhibitors. So these medications are not used very often due to the risk for hypertensive crisis. Tyramine is found in foods such as avocados, figs, fermented or smoked meats, liver, dried or cured fish, most cheeses, beer, wine, and protein dairy supplements. So tyramine in these foods causes a medication interaction, which could cause a hypertensive crisis. So this medication is not used very commonly anymore. And monoamine oxidase is an enzyme that breaks down serotonin, norepinephrine, and dopamine in the brain. And the MAOI blocks this act activity, so it elevates those levels. Again, severe hypertensive crises can result from interactions with food and other medications. So individuals have to avoid aged cheese like cheddar or Swiss, processed meats like salami, pepperoni, smoked fish, no beer, no wine, no avocados, figs, raisins, bananas. They also can't have caffeinated beverages or chocolate because these foods contain tyramine. So that's one reason why these medications are not used very much today, except for atypical depression. And remember, you would want to avoid using them with TCAs or SSRIs because of serotonin syndrome. The two Atypical antidepressants listed on this slide can actually both be taken with SSRIs with very little concern for serotonin syndrome. So bupropion or Wellbutrin has fewer sexual side effects and a low risk of weight gain. And it also helps control nicotine addiction as well as treat depression. The one thing I'd caution is that it can increase anxiety in people. So I would watch for that. I would, you have to avoid grape juice, grapefruit juice, um, and it can lower seizure threshold levels. So you'd want to avoid this medication in clients who are at risk for seizures, but also who are at risk for electrolyte imbalance. Trazodone is used mostly for sleep. The one side effect that you need to note is that in rare cases, priapism or prolonged erection of the penis may occur. This is considered a medical emergency and the individual should get medical treatment right away. Serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor inhibitors or SNRIs work by blocking the reabsorption of serotonin and norepinephrine in the brain. These include venlafaxine or Effexor, duloxetine or Cymbalta, and desvinlafaxine or Pristique. Adverse effects may include nausea, weight gain, or sexual dysfunction. Um, clinically speaking, I don't see weight gain very often on these medications. Withdraw from these medications, so when patients discontinue the medication, can be pretty difficult. So I personally would also advise the clients to do that slowly. People who have glaucoma, including uncontrolled narrow angle or angle closure glaucoma, should not take Cymbalta.
Many individuals want to know, when will I feel better? Sometimes it takes two to six weeks or longer, up to three months for these medications to work. During that time, some patients will stop the medication and then they could experience withdrawal syndrome if they do it incorrectly. The withdrawal syndrome or discontinuation symptoms include headaches, nausea, it kind of feels like the flu, visual disturbance, anxiety, blackouts, memory loss. So we would want to instruct the client to taper. We don't want them to just stop the medication right away. However, we also need to educate them. It could take two to six weeks to work. We have to regrow dendrites and axons and those renewed dendrites increase the number of neuron connections. So this is an important part of patient education. Earlier, we mentioned briefly other therapeutic procedures for depression, and those included ECT or electroconvulsive therapy, TMS or transcranial magnetic stimulation, and VNS, vagus nerve stimulation. Vagus nerve stimulation is an implanted device that stimulates the vagus nerve, and it can be used in clients who have depression and has been resistant to at least four antidepressant medications. Transcranial magnetic stimulation, or TMS, uses electromagnetic stimulation of the brain. The individual goes into the office every day, Monday through Friday, for approximately 20 minutes and sits in what looks like a dental chair. A psychiatrist maps the brain and a technician then applies the treatment and a tapping sound occurs in order to sort of reset the neurotransmitters. There are very little side effects except for headache to this type of treatment. Electroconvulsive therapy is when an individual is put underneath anesthesia and a seizure is induced. And this is not the first, second, third, or even fourth line of treatment. This is for the most severe cases of depression. And this concludes our lecture on depression. Please see our list of references.